Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and I have another weekly video for you. In the first half of this video, I'm going to talk all about grinding and sifting grains. And then in the second half of the video, I'm going to take you through a Sunday afternoon power hour where I try to accomplish as much kitchen prep as I possibly can. So if you don't want to learn all about a wheat berry, the parts of a wheat berry, and how you grind and sift it to make various flours, skip to the second half of this video. And then at the very end, I'm going to update you on the chicks that we are hatching that are in our incubator. So lots of fun things in this video. Let's go ahead and get started. Today is my daughter Grace's 12th birthday, and I need to make her a birthday cake. And so I'm going to show you that process. We are going to grind some fresh wheat berries down to make this cake. We're going to sift that flour to make a homemade version of store-bought all-purpose flour. So you guys know I did the pantry challenge in the months of January and February, and I didn't do any grocery shopping during those months. And I do this every year, um, partially to save money, but to also eat through our food stash. A lot of different reasons I've explained before. But it's now March, and we've ended that pantry challenge. And because I did that, I saved myself nearly $2,000 in grocery costs because our family budget for groceries is typically $1,000 a month. I didn't do any grocery shopping apart from some birthday meals. I had a birthday in January and a birthday in February that I had to shop for, so I did spend a little money there. So it's a little under $2,000 that I saved. So every year I do something for myself to kind of treat myself with the money that I saved. And typically I purchase something that will make my life a little bit easier because I worked really hard to cook all those meals for two straight months from scratch. And I want something that will make my life easier. So if you've followed me for a while, you know that I've had a Nutramil grain mill for probably three years now. And I really dislike it. I had the original Nutramil grain mill that was the one... It was like one cylindrical shape and the flour came out of a canister in the bottom of it and I loved it but I accidentally put um, grain in it that wasn't completely thawed and it ruined the motor and so when I replaced it I did the second model of the Nutramil which is the one that had the canister it shoots the flour out into the canister on the side and I hated it it was awful I've suffered through it for three years now it spits flour everywhere I even got a replacement lid for the canister to see if that would help. It still makes a huge mess. It's big and it's bulky and there's not enough space for it on my kitchen counters because I have a very small kitchen. And so I have to get it out, haul it out, and set it up every time I want to use it. And it's just inconvenient and really messy. And I've suffered through it for three years because a grain mill is a big investment and um, it seemed silly to replace it when I had one that was functioning that just made me work a little extra harder. But since I had the money from the uh, pantry challenge this year, I decided to purchase a new grain mill. And so the one that I, I decided to go with Nutramil again because I loved my original one. And I'm doing a third model. This is a different one that I've never had before. It's smaller and more compact and it's attractive and it can just sit on my kitchen counter and there's no canister. It spits it right into a bowl, which allows it to be smaller. <clears throat> I'm very excited. So I bought that. We set it up last week and I've been using it and I'm really loving it. And then the other small purchase that I made to make my grinding of grains easier is I bought an electric sifter and it fits right on top of my Bosch mixer. And prior to this, I would have to hand sift. I had a little hand sifter that you had to squeeze like this and it took forever, especially if you're doing big batch baking for such a large family as mine. To get through 10 cups of flour and hand sift it, I mean, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my arm was aching by the end of it. It was messy. Um, and so this electric sifter solves that issue. So I'm grateful that the pantry challenge allowed us to have the funds to purchase some of these items. And it will just make cooking from scratch that much easier for me. That is sort of my reward for the last couple months. So <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about grinding grains. I'll talk specifically about wheat, but we grind lots of other grains here in our house. I do corn, buckwheat, sorghum, rice, even beans and split peas and things like that for gluten-free flours I will use my grain mill for. But today we're going to use wheat because that's the most common thing that I grind for the children. There are two types of wheat berries. There are hard wheat berries and soft wheat berries. 
Hard wheat berries are best for baking bread. They have a higher gluten content, so you'll get a good rise on your bread if you use hard wheat berries. We typically purchase hard red wheat berries from Azure Standard in bulk. And then for other types of baking where you don't need that gluten because you're gonna add another type of leavening agent or um, you're going to do like a, a yeast bread or something where you'll add the yeast to it. With those, I use soft wheat berries and we typically use soft white wheat berries. And that's what I'm gonna use today. I'm gonna do soft white wheat to make a birthday cake. So a little bit about why we need to sift that flour before I can make it into a cake. So a wheat berry, let me grab one here. It looks like this, <laughs> if you can see it. It's like the seed of the wheat plant. And so like most seeds, there's a hard coating on the outside of it. And that is called the bran. That is when you make bran muffins or you get a bran cereal. That is what they're using to make that. It's the coating of the wheat berry. And there are other parts to the wheat berry. There's a part called the germ and it's very high in oil. And then the part that we typically, when you buy like an all purpose flour, the part that you have left over is the endosperm, and that um, is the softer part of the wheat berry that's on the inside. And you can store wheat berries like this because that seed coating is intact around the outside of it. These store for a really long time in good storage conditions, meaning um, if they're kept dry, if they're kept cool, if they're kept um, out of light, things like that. And so that's why a lot of people prefer to um, grind their own grains is you can purchase in bulk the, the large amount of wheat berries and just grind them as needed and they stay, um, they stay good in storage. As soon as you grind that wheat berry down though, that wheat starts to lose nutrition. I did, I've done research and if I remember correctly, um, within 24 hours of grinding the wheat, you've lost approximately 30% of the nutrition. It's either 30 or 40%. And then within 72 hours, it's up to 90% of the nutrition is lost. So there's a nutritional advantage to grinding your wheat. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned, the germ part of that wheat berry is very high in oil. And so once you grind it down and mix that in with the other parts of the wheat berry, that oil will begin to go rancid. And so you have to think about that when you're buying pre-ground flour in the grocery store that could potentially be months old. There are months past the point of being ground into flour. The oils have started to um, degrade and cause it to potentially become rancid and then it's lost a lot of the nutrition. So um, that is why I like to grind my grains. Now, I mentioned this on Instagram this week and I wanted to let you know I don't always grind my grains. I am very busy and in an ideal world I would do this every time I'm baking. But there are days where I'm just super busy or it's a hectic morning and I do purchase some pre-ground flour. Um, but if I were buying pre-ground flour in bulk, I try to store it in cool conditions. I store it in the freezer until I'm going to pull it out and use it and fill my um, bucket that I keep it in because I wanna preserve as much of the nutrition and prevent that rancidity from happening. So anyways, hopefully that answers some questions about um, wheat berries. So the reason that I need to sift it is when I grind the whole wheat berry down, it contains all three parts of that wheat berry. And that's the healthiest um, version of a wheat berry because the bran and the germ is very nutritious. It contains so many essential nutrients in it but it's very dense. The texture of it isn't soft and fluffy. And so if you wanna get a soft and fluffy flour, like an all-purpose flour you purchase in the store, you need to sift out the bran. And so that is what we're gonna to do today to make a birthday cake because I don't want a gritty um, texture of, uh, with the bran and the germ in our birthday cake. I want it to be light and fluffy. So the thing you have to know though is when you sift out the bran and the germ, you lose a little bit of volume. I need three cups of flour for my birthday cake recipe. So I'm gonna do approximately four cups of wheat berries and I'm gonna grind them down. You lose about 17 to 20% of the volume of flour when you grind out the, um, the germ and the bran. And so having some extra wheat berries in there will accommodate for that. Plus, you think about wheat berries when they're <laughs> measured out, there's a lot of space between the berries. 
but then once you grind it down, it's gonna compact a little bit. So four cups of berries should be plenty for my three cups of flour that I need in my recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'll measure it out and then I'll show you the new equipment that I got to grind this down. This is my new wheat grinder, my grain mill. And here are our wheat berries, our four cups of wheat berries. I found a stem in there I needed to pick out. And what I love about this mill is that all I have to do is open up the top and pour the grains in and it will just shoot it out right into the bowl. And I can adjust how finely I would like it to be ground by turning the little green knob on the very top. Um, so there are several companies that make grain mills. I know Mock Mill makes a version that looks very similar to this that people absolutely love. I just stuck with Nutramill because I really did love the very first mill that I had from them. And I had heard that people enjoyed this model. It was just that model that I had in between that didn't work out for me. And I just think there was a design flaw in it. But this one works out great and it shoots it out. So what we're gonna end up with when this is done is what is considered whole grain flour. When you purchase whole grain flour, this is what you have. When you sift out the brand and the germ, that is considered white flour. And so there's a lot of information about there, out there about which is healthier for you. And whole grain definitely does have more nutrients in it, but it does need to be properly prepared. You do need to soak whole grain flours in order for your body to absorb all of those nutrients properly. So that's why things like sourdough or sprouted grains, sprouting the wheat berries before you grind them, things like that will make it healthier and those nutrients more bioavailable. If you're not going to soak the bran part, the, the seed coating of that wheat berry, then it might be better for you to have the freshly ground white flour that has that bran sifted out. So there are advantages to both and that's a whole different topic that we could get into on another day, but our grind, our grain has now finished grinding. So we're going to move on to the next step. There we go. That is what that flour looks like. It's just a little denser than an all purpose or a white flour. Here is the sifter. I'm just pouring that whole grain directly onto the top of the sifter. And as I mentioned, this fits directly on my Bosch mixer. And then the flour will be sifted through and it will go directly into the canister below. This has very little mess to it. I'm very excited about this because when I would hand sift, it was a very messy process and flour dust would be all over in the air. So this contains it all and does it very quickly. So it took approximately five minutes to grind down the wheat berries and then another five minutes here to sift out the flour. So it just added 10 extra minutes to the process of baking. So worth it for the extra nutrition and superior flour that you get. So I'm going to take this apart and kind of show you what we have. It looks just like all purpose flour. You can see how light and fluffy and soft it is. It's just perfect. So now I'm going to measure this out for you. I wouldn't normally do this, but I just wanted to show you something here. So we started with four cups of wheat berries and obviously we um, sifted out 20% of the volume of that, but we still ended up with four cups of flour. And the reason for that is that freshly sifted flour is so much more fluffier. <laughs> There's a lot of air in there. So you'll find that some recipes call for sifted flour and this is what they're asking for. But store-bought flour that you get is compacted. It's much more dense because the flour has sat there and those air pockets between it, the flour is gone. And so most of our baking recipes are for store-bought compacted flour. So even though I ended up with four cups of fluffy, freshly sifted flour, I'm going to count this as three cups of flour that my recipe calls for because this would be the same amount of flour that three cups of store-bought flour would be. Hopefully that makes sense. But <laughs> anyways, I was just showing you that, that we did end up with four cups of um, sifted flour. And normally I would just leave that directly in my mixing bowl and there would be no extra mess, and we can just add our other ingredients and get going with making our cake. But first, let me show you what is left behind through the sifting process. Up here in the top canister, we have all of our bran and the germ, 
You can do many things with this. You can make bran muffins. You can make bran cereal. A lot of people have uh, different culinary uses for the bran. I am just going to put this into our canister here for our mealworm farm. And that's a project I'll be showing you guys here in a future video. We um, farm mealworms as supplemental food for our chickens and as an educational uh, activity for our little ch our littler children. And so we will store this in the freezer if we're going to bake with it. And if not, we will add it to our mealworm farm. Now we just need to get started with baking our cake. And David is going to do that for me. He is the baker in the house and he always loves as a gift for his siblings to make the birthday cake. And we have a wonderful a vanilla dairy-free birthday cake recipe that I will leave in the description of this video. I've made it for you guys before in other videos, but David baked the cake for me, but then he was busy in the afternoon and he left me to decorate it. I am not a baker like him. <laughs> His cakes turn out so much prettier than mine do, but I just decided to go ahead and do this for him and I tried my best and we just had to <laughs> settle for the results of mom's cake. When I bake cakes, I typically don't like to do tiered round cakes like this because they're so much harder to ice and make look pretty. David makes it David makes it look so easy when he does it. When I make a birthday cake, I typically put this recipe into a 9 by 13 pan, but it turned out just fine. Grace loved her cake, even though mom <laughs> didn't do the best decorating job. And I can't believe my beautiful daughter turned 12 this week. She's just really growing up and she is a treasure and such a blessing to our family and we just couldn't be prouder of her. So we had fun celebrating her 12th birthday this week. Now we're gonna move on to our next portion of the video. I'm gonna take you through what I did on Sunday afternoon. The baby was napping, and I knew I had approximately an hour to get as much work in the kitchen done as I could. And my goal in doing this kind of power hour was to do a lot of meal prep to make particularly breakfasts, but other snacks and things like that for the week that would just make life easier because things are so busy. So let me take you through and show you the first thing that I needed to do was to make a list of everything that I wanted to accomplish so that I would be organized. So this was my idea. And I knew that I wouldn't get through all of this in an hour, but I thought maybe she'll take an extra long nap and I'll be able to get a little extra done. So my goal was just to go through and get as much done on this list as I possibly could. So we started with making granola. I've also made this for you before, but it's different every time I make it. On this day, we have our oats and I'm adding cashew pieces. Sometimes I do almonds or other nuts. We're also going to sprinkle in some cinnamon. That was quite a bit of cinnamon. And then we need to add our sweetener. I am using our homegrown raw honey. Um, sometimes I'll use maple syrup. I do like to stick to a natural sweetener just so that it's a little healthier for the children. Um, and then we need to add a fat. We're doing a regular olive oil. Regular olive oil doesn't have that strong olive flavor. So in all of my baking and things, that's what I use. I do not use extra virgin olive oil. It has a lower heat point, so it's not as good for baking and cooking. And I think it has a stronger flavor, but I, we don't even notice an olive flavor when we use regular olive oil in our baking and our cooking. So you just really have to get in there with the granola and mix it around because that raw honey, you know, is clumped together. So we want to thoroughly mix all of our ingredients here. You can add whatever you want, shredded coconut, pumpkin seeds, you name it, just to make um, a delicious granola. We're going to grab our cookie sheets. And since I'm going to be doing lots of other baking and I'm trying to do it as quickly as possible, I am not going to want to take time to clean our cookie sheets. So I put down some parchment paper. We spread our granola out, and then I'm going to bake this on 350 degrees for 15 minutes. Then I'm going to stir it around and then put it in for another 10 minutes after that. So this was my first task. We're going to get that in the oven, and while it's baking, we can move on to something else. And this is why I really enjoy making lists. <laughs> I like to cross things off and get that feeling of accomplishment. So moving on to the next thing. While I had the cashew pieces out from the granola, I decided to go ahead and uh, prepare some cashew milk, not only for the baking that we're going to be doing, but also uh, for the week. So we would have some maybe to eat with the granola or to make some smoothies or whatever we were going to do this week. So I put my cashews in the bottom 
and filled it up with water. And then to sweeten this batch of cashew milk, I'm adding two pitted dates. Sometimes we sweeten it, sometimes we don't. Uh, my kids definitely prefer it with the sweetened flavor. So when we have dates in the house, we add that. Add a little bit of vanilla also for flavor. And then we are just gonna run that through the blender for a couple minutes till it's nice and thick and creamy. And then I need to strain this out. If I had soaked my cashews overnight, we would have way less pulp. But because I didn't think I had to do that, we have this pulp left behind, but it will not go to waste. I'm scooping that out and putting it into a bowl. And we're gonna use that here in a little bit to make some homemade energy bites. They're gonna be delicious. To strain this out, these are actually sink strainers. Now I don't use these ones in my sink because that would be pretty gross. But these are clean ones that I have just for the purpose of straining things through my canning jars. I find that they fit perfect in the top of canning jars and I'm always using canning jars for things so I keep a couple extra sink strainers in my drawer and it works perfectly for this particular purpose. So we ended up with some really nice creamy cashew milk. It tasted great and then like I said this leftover pulp will become something else. I don't like to have any waste in my cooking so try to come up with purposes for everything. And because I'm rushing, I am making waste. <laughs> I'm spilling things. I'm trying to get as much done in this hour as I can, and so I'm rushing, and that always leads to accidents and um, you know mistakes. So we need to slow down here and be a little more intentional and purposeful. So two quarts of this will go into the fridge to be used this week, and then the jar that isn't completely full we will use for our other baking, for our muffins and things that we're going to make. You'll see here our leftover pulp, and I will often just put that in the fridge and use it for whatever baking project we're doing next, but today we're gonna to use it to make energy bites. But before we get to that, I need to get some bread going. I put two cups of warm water into my mixer, and then I'm adding four tablespoons of yeast. It just so happened that that was the exact amount of yeast that I had left in my jar. So I keep my extra yeast in the freezer. That preserves it for longer. So I just pulled a new one out, and I'm going to set that out and let it thaw completely before I refill my jar of yeast. We also want to add some sweetener to this, and I am once again using that raw honey. I add a couple of tablespoons, maybe two to three tablespoons, to the yeast and water mixture. And since that water is warm, that will help kind of dissolve that honey, kind of melt it down a little bit. And then what we can do is set aside this yeast mixture and let it um, fully activate while we move on to a separate project. So just trying to get as much done here in a short period of time and be as efficient as possible. So the next project is making jello. I told you guys I'm back doing gaps and jello is a wonderful sweet um, treat for me when I'm doing gaps and can't have sugar. So I make a lot of jello. What I started doing here is draining two quarts of Concord grape juice and I put it into a pot and we're going to get that on the stove warming up. So then we're going to do the rest of the jello. I'm going to do two separate batches. The first one is for me. There'll be no sugar in it. So I'm draining um, two pints of home canned blueberries. So I drain the blueberry juice from the jar to make the jello and then we're gonna once again not waste the fruit we're gonna set the blueberries aside to make some muffins later on so the liquid will become jello and then the solids will become a muffin for the children so just pressing that down getting as much of that liquid out as I can so that is in the first pot now or the first pan in the second pan, we're going to use some leftover grape syrup. This is from a, pale, a failed batch of jelly, so that syrup definitely has sugar in it, and so that's why I'm making two separate batches. The children can have sugar right now. I cannot have sugar on gaps, but I need a little bit more liquid in my jello, so I found a pint of, this is apple pulp. It was from making apple juice. This is what was left over behind, and I went ahead and canned it up, and then we can extract some of the extra apple juice from that. And then the pulp that I am scraping out is added to the cashews that I have set aside. And those that will also go into my energy bites. So trying to not waste anything here um, 
during my little kitchen prep day. Now we're going to add our gelatin. I'm doing maybe a third a cup of gelatin per dish here. And the great thing about gelatin is it dissolves right into colder liquids. So that's why we have the separation of the cold liquid and the warm liquid on the stove. So we put the gelatin into the cold liquid here. And then by the time we're all done, the grape juice that I added to the pot that's on the stove can be poured back in and then mixed. If you were to add the gelatin to the hot liquid, it would clump right up. So it's just like making store-bought jello in the little boxes that you get. It's just a little bit of a healthier product because there's no food dye in it and you can make it without sugar, which makes it safe for me um, on gaps. So let me show you after that set in the fridge for a couple of hours, we can slice that up. And I enjoyed this as a little sweet snack throughout the week. It just gives me a little bit of something to kind of curb any um, cravings that I'm having. And it's full of healthy protein with all of that gelatin in it. So that turned out great. So we could cross our jello off the list. And by the time we were done making the jello, our yeast had activated and we can move on to finishing our bread. So to this yeast mixture, I need to add seven cups of flour. That will make me three little loaves of bread. I also add half a cup of olive oil. Once again, this is just regular olive oil. It's not um, extra virgin. And you could use any kind of fat that you wanted in place of that olive oil. I'm also going to add approximately a teaspoon of salt. And then we're going to let our mixer knead that together. And while the mixer's going, move on to the next task of making some juice for the children. First thing I'm doing is draining a quart here of home canned cranberry juice. I've done videos before on how I make this juice. And we're going to reserve those cranberries. We could turn them into a jam. We could make another batch of juice. Or we could feed them to the chickens and turn them into eggs. We um, just Anything we want to do with that leftover fruit. When I make my juices, I raw pack the fruit in water. And so we always have fruit left over. So we started with two quarts of cranberry juice. That's unsweetened, so it's very tart. So what I like to do is then add two quarts of home canned Concord grape juice. It's a little sweeter and helps balance out the cranberry. Since this is for the children, I'm also going to sweeten this. I'm just adding a little bit of sugar, stir it around and let that dissolve, and then we're going to fill it the rest of the way with water. And then I can just put this in the fridge and then whenever the children want a little juice with a breakfast or a snack, that will be ready for them this week. And by the time we were done making our juice, the bread was pretty much mixed together. I like the mixer to do about 75% of the job for me, but I like to finish off my kneading by hand just so that I can feel it and get it to the texture that I like. Um, if you bake bread, you know that you, you kind of go by feeling when you know that that bread has been kneaded appropriately. So it's all needed. We set it aside to warm up um, and rise. And while that is happening, now we can move on to the next step. So our granola finished. Um, it kind of cooked a little longer than we wanted it to, but that's okay. And we're going to put that in a pot and let it, um, we're going to finish making it. So while it's warm, we can add chocolate chips to it. That will help melt those chocolate chips down so that you're not just eating, crunching into a chocolate chip while you eat your granola. And then we're going to add our dried fruit. We did dried cranberries on this particular day, but you can add any dried fruit. We like raisins, uh, freeze-dried blueberries we've done, freeze-dried apples, anything like that. And like I said, since this is warm, those um, chocolate chips will just melt as we stir it. But before we get that packaged up, we're going to have to kind of set it aside and let it cool down. And little Benjamin there was my helper. He wanted to <laughs> take a turn stirring, but he couldn't quite get it done with the spatula there. So, all right, we our bread is out of the mixer, and so now we can put something else in it and get it going while we have our bread dough rising and our granola cooling. We can move on to another project. I was going to make pumpkin muffins, and then I realized since I had the blueberries sitting out, I would go ahead and make blueberry muffins instead. So that is what we are going to get to work making. And Benjamin is going to help me. So getting out my flower bucket here, we're getting low on 
pre-ground flour. Um, I'm adding two cups of flour and little Benjamin is just dying to pour those blueberries into the <laughs> into the bowl. I need to go get a half a cup of sugar though. While I had my back turned, he almost poured those in. <laughs> so we added our half a cup of sugar. Now we're gonna add two teaspoons of baking powder. I like to do all my dry ingredients first. And then we have a half a teaspoon of salt. Now he can go ahead and add those blueberries. I'm going to add one cup of our cashew milk that we just made. And then I'm gonna crack one egg there. And we're gonna put one egg into the mixture. We also need a half a cup of olive oil and one teaspoon of vanilla. And that is my blueberry muffin recipe. I'm just greasing this into a pie dish. Uh, it's just easier, less dishes, and um, a little less mess than putting it in muffin in a muffin tin. So we've got to get that thoroughly mixed together. And I was just trying to save on dishes and not use a regular mixing bowl. But this is the one thing about the Bosch <laughs> mixing bowl is that um, it is kind of hard to hand mix things in it. But we got it done. We got that muffin batter poured into our pie dish and then that is going to go in the oven on 400 degrees for about 20 minutes. Our granola is cooled now and it's ready to package up. I'm just using a gallon glass jar and this will go on the pantry shelf for the children to have as a snack or breakfast during the week. Okay now to get to that cashew pulp and then remember I added the apple pulp from the apple juice jar. So that is put back into the blender and then to it I added 10 pitted dates and now we're just gonna add a bunch of random ingredients you can't really mess up energy bites since that pulp was a little wet though I did add about three tablespoons of almond flour that will help kind of soak up some of the excess moisture in this I'm also adding a little bit of cinnamon and then I decided to make this batch chocolatey, so just a little bit, just maybe one tablespoon of cacao powder, because that can be very bitter if you add too much of it. And then we're going to blend that together, and it kind of turns into a paste. All of those nuts, it's almost like it turned into cashew butter in a way. And then we just dollop that out onto our baking sheet, onto some parchment paper, and then we're gonna throw that in the oven with the blueberry muffins until they are uh, they are done. Our bread dough has risen, and now we can get this going for a second rise. I'm just greasing up my loaf pans here. As I mentioned, this recipe made three little loaves of bread, and then we can use these throughout the week as like a side dish for a meal with some jam. I divide the dough into three little sections, kind of get it shaped. And then we are gonna set these aside and let them rise again for about another hour. And then we'll bake those later on. We're kind of nearing the end of the time that I'm going to have to work. I can sense that the baby is going to be waking up soon. So just kind of assessing my list, seeing if there's anything else I can get done quickly. But I think I realized at this point we did about as much as we could. So not too bad for, it was a little under an hour at that point because I had created so many dishes here that I knew I needed to stop and get these done before the baby woke up. And then after the dishes were done, all of our baked goods were all ready to be um, taken out of the oven. We have some delicious little energy bites. These are gaps friendly, so those will be a nice treat for me throughout the week. And then we have our blueberry muffin pie for the children that just needs to cool down a little bit before I slice it up. Not too bad for an hour's worth of work. I felt very prepared for the week. I got Benjamin now down for his nap just in time to put my feet up for a few minutes before the baby woke up. And then later on that day, I threw those loaves of bread into the oven and baked them. And then we will store those just in my little cake container here. And that will keep those fresh and moist for the rest of the week for when we use them. And then once that blueberry muffin pie, <laughs> I don't know what to call it, a muffin pie. Once that cooled down a little bit, we could get that sliced up. So that recipe made one dozen muffins. So in a pie dish, I cut it into eight pieces so that all of the children and Adam can have one. 
So each one of those little pie slices is about the equivalent of maybe one and a half blueberry muffins. So that doesn't go very far with this many children, but it's a nice addition to a breakfast. So maybe one day they can have that with some scrambled eggs and some granola or something like that, and that would be a full breakfast. Just wanted to kind of show you what that bread looked like a little later on in the day. For that dinner, I decided to slice up one of those loaves and serve it with some, I think we did blueberry jam that night. We can't have butter, so we have to do um, jam with our bread if we want to spread something on it. But it slices very easily, and you can see what the inside texture of that looks like. Just a really easy yeast bread that my family really enjoys. Doing that little power hour of work really made my week that much easier. It was just nice to have snacks and things ready for the kids, so I highly recommend that. Also wanted to update you guys on the incubator project. You guys know that last week we put 22 eggs into our incubator and are working on hatching those out. It was day seven this week and we needed to candle the eggs. Candling, as you can see, is just putting the egg on top of a light source in a dark room and you can see through that shell and see if anything is growing. And this is amazing. You can see it seven days. We already have a little chick just moving around in there. That large dark dot is the eyeball. And then you can see the baby chick and all of the veins and everything. So we candle at day seven and we candle again at day 14 just to assess for growth. And then on day 21, we can expect to have baby chicks. So very exciting process for the children. We love doing this. And they're following along and learning all about um, baby animals and the beautiful miracles that God uses in order to grow life in this world. Lots of school happening this week, and that was about it. I hope you guys enjoyed following along with everything we were up to this week. I hope that you guys also had a wonderful week, and we will be back next week with more fun here at Three Rivers Homestead. Until then, we hope you guys are blessed. Bye.